What's up, y'all? The Nature Girl 30 here, and another WrestleMania is officially done, dusted in the books. And honestly, y'all, I have a lot to say about this pay per view. But before I get into night one's matches, I'm gonna talk about the set design as well as the entrances. Now, not everybody had an entrance. Those that you expected to have one didn't. Um, I expected Becky Lynch to have one, but she didn't at all. Um, Rhea Ripley had one. Of course, she had um, her band that plays her theme was actually playing her out, which is something that we see a lot on these pay-per-views. So it just didn't feel special to me. The ones that felt the most special was definitely Sami Zayn's entrance when he was kind of doing a whole Rocky Balboa-esque type of thing. And also The Rock's final boss entrance. That was fire. That was something worth talking about. Everybody else was kind of lackluster, including, well, Jay Cargill, Naomi, and Bianca Belair. I know they were paying tribute to um, Beyonce, especially Cowboy Carter, the album that just came out but it just did not feel special enough to me. But I wish the entrances were bigger because they advertised this pay-per-view to be one of the biggest WrestleManias that has ever happened in history. And it just didn't feel special. The set design was average. It just didn't feel like it was larger than life. The only thing that was different was it was green and it was really big XL letters. That's it. That's all we got out of it. And it just didn't really feel that special to me. I wish they did more, but I guess they had to do only so much. But anyway, y'all, let's get started talking about the first match of the night. Kicking off the first match of night one was Becky Lynch versus Rhea Ripley for the Women's World Championship. Honestly, y'all, this match really wasn't all that great. I actually expected it to be better, especially with all the heat and the hype that was going into it. But I can't necessarily hate fully on it because I end up finding out that Becky Lynch had strep throat doing this and 102 fever. She was battling sick. <laughs> That's the one thing that I didn't really know. But knowing that she was sick and she went out there and performed the way she did, I am impressed. She had her heart in making this match the best she could make it. And of course, you had Rhea Ripley coming out to a band that played her theme music, which was pretty cool. And she played the hero mommy very, very well. Honestly, y'all, this match could have been better, but I'm not going to really criticize it that harshly because of the fact that Becky Lynch was sick. It was still a pretty good performance. They did tell somewhat of a story in the ring. They told the best way they could. You saw that Becky Lynch fought so hard to try to beat Rhea Ripley, everything she could possibly do. And Rhea Ripley was fighting even harder to retain her title. So I can't necessarily hate on that, uh, on the fact that it was kind of clunky and it was a little bit off in a few places. It was mainly because Becky was sick and they worked the best way that they could. And she was highly professional about how she was wanting to make this work. And I wouldn't be surprised if the cold really helped her. She had 102 fever that kept the fever from actually going a little bit too high because I think it was like 49 degrees. Um, that night so honestly the fact that they fought as hard as they did and they were able to tell a story in the ring it's a shame that Becky Lynch was sick but this match really wasn't all that bad it wasn't great but it wasn't all that bad so I'm giving it a three out of five the next match that's up on this card is the six-man tag match for the undisputed tag team championships with DIY awesome truth a town down under the New Cash Republic, New Day, and of course you had the defending champions, the Judgment Day. Guys, this match in itself was a car crash, but it was a car crash that I love so much to watch. <laughs> and honestly, y'all, I think it was a nice touch how Xavier Woods came out dressed as not only his old character from TNA, Consequences Creed, he was also based out of a based from Apollo Creed from the Rocky movies. So it was nice to actually see that Rocky edge, that whole Rocky touch being brought into this match here. I kind of felt that throughout the match. But y'all, again, this was a just a train wreck. I absolutely loved it though. From one spot to another. But the one thing that I did not want, that I actually said in my predictions, 
that I guess won right, but I was half right because I did not expect them to split the titles up until I saw how they strung them up. When they strung them up to the ceiling, I had a gut feeling they were going to split them up. But who was going to win the Raw belts? Unfortunately, it was the one I didn't want to win, and that was Awesome Truth. Awesome Truth ended up winning the Raw Tag Team Championships and A-Town Down Under. The one that I actually did guess right did take the SmackDown titles. So yeah, I didn't really get what I wanted, but I did get a new team. Even though I don't like that team, I did ask for a fresh team to actually be the tag team champs. And at least I got half that, so it wasn't totally bad. But honestly, y'all, this match was pretty good. I really did enjoy it. I'll give it a three out of five. This is definitely a match that I really didn't care that much about um, starting off because I think the storyline was a little bit weak. But this is um, Santos Escobar and Dominic Mysterio versus Rey Mysterio and the replacement Andrade because unfortunately Dragon Lee got taken out on SmackDown so Andrade actually took his place. If you like Lucha, you're going to love this match. And to be honest with you, as quick and fast paced as Lucha is... This was kind of a cool down match compared to the chaos that we saw previously with the ladder match. So it was somewhat enjoyable. And it was a really great way to bring your blood pressure down, just to enjoy the show, and just to see exactly what they can offer. And I didn't really care much for it because the feud was kind of weak, at least to me. And it was kind of nice to see Selena getting involved. But honestly, y'all, there's really one reason why I like this match. And yeah, it's a bit selfish. But I like it because of the mass luchadors. And one of them, <laughs> being one of my favorites, Jason Kelsey. Yep, I am a fan of the Kelsey brothers. I love both Travis and Jason. Jason being the man. And the fact that he came out there with a mass luchador and with, with a luchador mask on, the infamous luchador mask that he was talking about from his podcast is awesome. I mean, Jason Kelsey's the man. He will always be the man. So that, that match was fun. I really enjoyed it, but mainly it was because it's for, uh, it, was, it was for Jason Kelsey. I'm not going to lie. It was for Jason Kelsey. But I do like Lucha, but it was for Jason Kelsey. I got to give this match definitely a 3 out of 5. This was really a fun match to watch. The next match I'm going to talk about is the Us versus Us match, or Uso versus Uso. In other words, Jimmy versus Jay Uso. Honestly, y'all... I know that this match may not be the next match that we saw that night, but I'm just going to talk about the matches that are on the top of my head. And this one, by far, was the weakest match on the card. Maybe because we've actually seen the Usos either go against each other or work together. For some reason, it just didn't have the same energy as it had in the past. But it was something about the storytelling of this match that really won the crowd over. So even though this match was kind of boring, a little bit on the slow side, and I guess because I already kind of predicted what the outcome was going to be with Jay winning, I didn't really get that much into it. But like I said, it got Philadelphia. It really got Philadelphia hard. And they were all sucked into this match. Like they were really enjoying themselves, really into the storytelling of this match. And I think that's what... That was just kind of the gem of this match that made it not to be as boring as I thought it was. But it is by far the weakest match of the card. But I think what really got the fans to be won over was when, well, somehow Jay ended up getting fooled into thinking that Jimmy was going to change. And I think it was on the previous SmackDown how he said he missed his brother and how he missed being with him and how Jimmy, when he was on his knees saying, I'm sorry, it kind of won, it, it didn't really win him over, but it made him feel like maybe he is sorry. I really do miss him. I really do want him in my life again. I miss my brother. And when he was about to lift him up, we smelled the double cross coming a mile away. This guy is in the bloodline. He's in the bloodline for life. It's not going to change. But honestly, y'all, that was the only gem of this match that actually kept the crowd from either chanting or throwing beach balls, which is what they did that night for other matches but for this one well the right guy won i will tell you that and i got that right and i think everyone got that right but this match was still pretty boring and it was still the weakest match on the card so unfortunately 
I gotta give it a two. It's a shame because they, they really worked hard at this, but it's just it just seemed like it was a little off. So I gotta give it a two out of five. The next match that I want to talk about is Jade, Naomi, and Bianca versus Damage Control. Now, I already have concerns about Jade Cargill being in the match with these two veterans, and I've already done a video about ranting about how much they're overblowing and pretty much just pushing Jade Cargill to the moon, and it feels like Jade Cargill and the rest. And that's my biggest concern, especially with Naomi, who kind of felt like she was just there. Like, for some reason, she was it, she was there doing some moves a few times, and then she just disappeared for maybe five minutes of the match where everyone was like, where's Naomi? But that's the biggest concern I have, is that she is going to be eclipsed by Jade, and she really does not need that here. But going into the match itself, it was very balanced, very surprisingly ba balanced. I honestly thought it was going to be a bit clunky with this being Jade's first group match with everybody. But it was fairly balanced. Naomi had her few spots in. And of course you had Bianca Belair doing her powerhouse moves. And looking good doing them. And everybody had a role to play. It just no one was just sitting there waiting for something to happen. And surprisingly enough. I was really surprised and how well Jay was able to blend in with the others. But yeah was it a bit choreographed? It was. Which is a little bit of a concern because she has issues being natural when it comes to her moves. But it's something that she's going to have to grow into. But either or y'all, this was actually pretty balanced. I was really surprised at the outcome of all this. The one thing that I am afraid of, like I said before, I don't want Jay Cargill eclipsing everybody. Her moves were actually what she's built to do. And it was pretty, again, it was pretty solid. It was pretty balanced. I will give credit what credit is due, but I'm not giving full credit to her until she actually has a one-on-one -on -one match. But honestly, y'all, the fact that they were able to be dam damage control, they all showcased their moves, I'm fine. It was actually pretty decent. So I'm going to give it a three out of five. Okay, we finally got to my favorite match of the night. This is the match of the night the match of the night overall for both nights in my humble opinion the IC championship match with Gunther versus Sami Zayn oh my gosh did they channel their inner Rocky here with Sami Zayn being Rocky Balboa as well as Gunther being Ivan Drago I loved this match from start to finish from the moment that they actually had a camera following Sami Zayn all the way out to the ring, when he finally when he encountered Chad Gable before going out, when he met his his wife before meeting Chad Gable, and then after they he met both them, he encountered Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens wished him luck. He went out there, his music played. It was absolutely wonderful, just golden. I loved it. That was the best underdog story I have seen since Daniel Bryan. I loved every bit of this match. But I was torn because for those that actually have seen my videos, y'all know how big of a fan I am of Gunta. Because Gunta actually made something of the IC Championship again. He made it worth something. I hated that design, but he made that design worth it. He has such a healthy reign. And yes, was it a bit ominous that he actually lost his title when it was like the 666th day? Yeah, it, it was kind of a bit ominous but and a bit creepy and weird. But other than that, this was a spectacular match. I loved every bit of it. When he won, I screamed so loud to where I think I woke my dad up. But honestly, y'all, this was great. This was absolutely spectacular. I love this match. I love how it was put together. I love the story. The underdog story worked so well with the overall Rocky theme. The fact they were in Philadelphia it fit so well. He fought so hard. He didn't believe in himself, but he believed in himself that night. The win even made Samantha Irvin emotional. And she was emotional later on. I will get to that in a bit. But y'all, this was the match of the night. Five out of five this is not even a biased move this was just spectacular storytelling in the ring all together Sami Zayn is that type of guy that makes you feel something that makes you care about his character 
It was such wonderful character growth. It was such a well put together angle with them kind of incorporating Rocky in there. It was spectacular storytelling in the ring. Five out of five. Gunther will move on to better things. I believe that he's going to probably move on to a higher title. He deserves it. He earned it. But this is Sammy's time. He earned that spot too. Five out of five again. And now we reach the main event. Cody Rhodes and Seth freaking Rollins versus Roman Reigns and the final boss, The Rock. Oh, y'all, I have so many complaints for this match. And this match was actually the most promoted, especially by The Rock, with The Rock being the final boss. The biggest disappointment that I had was, number one, the bloodline rules made no sense, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But the bigger complaint is this match went on for too doggone long. 45 minutes 45 minutes it felt like a drag now we all know that roman reigns matches are not very fast they're kind of either medium pace to slow we know this it's not his fault but the rock didn't make it any better <laughs> but there were some points of where when he had his heel character persona as the final boss it made sense for the whole hint of what the bloodline rules could be and i'm saying hint in quotations but the match just dragged. It dragged out incredibly long. But I will say this, when it became a one-on-one -on -one moment between Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns, they know each other so well to where they can work out the pacing. It was very difficult with Cody. It was difficult with Cody and The Rock, and sometimes it was difficult between The Rock and Roman. It was kind of even paced with The Rock and Roman, but it was kind of clunky with The Rock. It just dragged. It went on so long. I just really wanted to end. So many kickouts. I was like, when is this going to be over? And honestly, the biggest complaint that I do have is the fact that, well, one of, because I just made two, is that The Rock made it clear to the referee that if you count me out, I'm going to fire you. Showing that he's the final boss. Which means that that angle, if you honestly think about it, when he threw that amount of weight out, that amount of clout out, shows that he can change the match any way he wanted to. That he had the ability to alter the outcome of the match despite Cody winning. So it really made the whole bloodline rules idea kind of pointless, as well as the match itself being one-on-one -on -one was pointless because The Rock could still change the outcome if he wanted to. And that was my biggest issue. If he has the ability to fire the ref, if he screws up, if he has the ability to ring the bell if he wanted to, if he had all that power to alter the match, that would have made it more interesting for, for Bloodline Rules, which really didn't have any rules. It made no sense. It was a regular DQ match. But I'm going to get into that later. That was one of my biggest gripes. He had this much power, use it. You're a part of the family. You're a part of the bloodline. You're a part of one of the most powerful dynasties in wrestling. Use that clout. And he didn't, which was very disappointing because the final boss in any video game that anybody has ever played would use any amount of power they had to take you down. He did not do that. It just felt boring because of it. It didn't feel interesting at all. And we had no Solo. Where was Solo Sokoa? How come he wasn't in night one? That was the most confusing part. He's part of Bloodline 2 and he wasn't there? What was he? But other than that, it didn't make any sense for them to win because of the outcome of the main event. And I, like I said, I will get into that in a minute. But the fact that the Bloodline won, I kind of predicted it because the Bloodline rules was an interesting Role. It, it was an interesting handicap or maybe a challenge for Cody in storyline. So it honestly made sense for them to win, but the match itself was long, it was clunky, it was boring. Oh my gosh, I wanted to end. This wasn't the weakest match on the card, it definitely was the longest. And it was just the most infuriating to watch. 
it's difficult for me. I'm really tempted to give it in a two because it just was really long, very boring. It took a very long time. There were some interesting spots. I'm not going to lie. There were. But, and also it kind of showcased the fact that The Rock was in control of everything in that match. So I can't necessarily give it a two because it told really a really, really good story tied into that. So I'll just give it a three. I'll just say it pretty much is somewhat average. But honestly, y'all, it was long. It went on way too long. And I know that they were trying to tell the story the best way they wanted, the best way they could and how they wanted to. But it just, it didn't work. It just did not work. And I already have my own personal feelings on how the outcome of this match really affected the main event from the previous, uh, for the next night. So I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But right now, like I said, this is a three out of five. Let's get on to match. Well, let's get on to night two. All right. The first match kicking off night two is the World Heavyweight Championship match with Seth freaking Rollins versus Drew McIntyre. I will say this about night two. Their entrances had a lot more pomp and circumstance than night one. It was nice that Drew McIntyre came in with a bunch of um, I guess uh, Celtic war, well not Celtic warriors, but Scottish warriors with broadswords kind of holding it over his head like he is some kind of a, um, a conquering king. And then you had Carnival. <laughs> this was pretty much Carnival straight up. And Seth Rollins had the most avant-garde attire I have ever seen. He always comes in there with different designs. I absolutely love his ring attire because it just fits how eccentric Seth Rollins is and he had pretty much carnival around the ring. I thought it was pretty cool. But honestly y'all, the one thing I can say about night two is that most of the matches here told a really big story, not only about the people in the ring, but overall storyline. For this match in general, it told a lot about both men. The fact that Seth Rollins had pretty much had his body just thrown through the ringer by helping um, Cody Rhodes with the bloodline the previous night he didn't have a lot of gas in the tank, but he was fighting really hard and he really wanted to keep his title. But of course, Drew McIntyre was able to capitalize on that because of how beaten Seth Rollins was. And he even warned him for the, um, he even warned him for like, I think the previous Raws, I believe. But for the previous shows, he actually warned him, you gotta pay attention to this match. If you are so busy helping out Cody, you're gonna be so beaten up, you won't be 100% when I face you. And I want you to be 100% when I face you because I want to beat you in the ring, in front of a crowd, at WrestleMania, to take your title when you're 100%. He wanted a legit win. And unfortunately, Seth Rollins did everything he could to, uh, to right the wrongs he did against Roman Reigns because he thinks that he's the main reason why Roman Reigns became the way he was. So he did everything he could to right those wrongs by helping out Cody. It cost him a lot. And unfortunately, it cost him the championship in a well-fought battle. And unfortunately, I missed the beginning of this. I heard that he had like few, like um, that Seth took five Claymores to the face. And a lot of people thought that was unbelievable, especially Irvin. He was kind of upset about that. But honestly, y'all, it told a really good story in the ring. It showed that no matter how much Seth Rollins tried to right the wrongs from the past, it cost him. But he was such a, he was such a hard fought warrior to where he has so many war wounds and it really did just cost him everything that I'm happy he's taking a break. I'm happy he's not a champion. He needs to rest. He deserves a rest. And also Drew McIntyre, I'm happy that he was able to win in front of a crowd, the one thing he's always wanted. And then that all changed very quickly when Drew McIntyre got a bit too arrogant because a one CM Punk was on commentary and he literally left the ring and he was picking on Punk to the point where he was standing on top of the table, gloating, saying that I'm better than you, had the belt in his face, only for him to lose it within seconds after CM Punk tripped him, landed on the table, fell down to the ground, and here comes Damian Priest to cash in his Money in the Bank briefcase and winning the World Heavyweight title minutes shoot mere seconds after drew won it that was a well executed 
money in the bank cash in, as well as a well done storyline. Now Seth is out of the picture. He has completed his storyline. Now it's time for Drew McIntyre to continue with his. But the biggest question now is which direction is Drew McIntyre going to go? Is he going to go in the direction of CM Punk, the guy he can't stand and the guy that was talking all types of crap about him? Or is he going to go and face Damian Priest to get the title that was stolen from him seconds after winning it? It can go in either direction, and I absolutely love how the story was executed. Five out of five. The next match is a six-man tag Philly Street fight between the Pride and the Final Testament. I don't know why they call themselves the Pride. I actually prefer the Almighty Prophets, but that's just me. I guess it's the whole religious thing. Maybe that'll be an issue. But anyway, this match didn't really so much tell a story between the Final Testament and the Pride. In my opinion, it was more of a character arc for the Street Profits. I have not seen the Street Profits that aggressive in a long time. They were always considered jokes, a bunch of clowns. Even if they had the title, they never took it seriously. And even Bianca Belair warned them, hey, you need to start taking things seriously and stop underestimating your opponents. Now they teamed up with Bobby Lashley, you can see a more aggressive side of them. And just like, um, um, and just like Montez Ford said during that interview, you know, tonight we choose violence. <laughs> That's the first time I have ever seen that man being aggressive over anything. And I honestly can give props to Angelo Dawkins too, because not only does his character have a lot more personality, he's a lot more aggressive and he takes things seriously. So, I mean, I'm really impressed. The Street Profits are finally starting to take things seriously and literally go get what they need to get. Go get the job done. That's what you need to do. And that's what they did in this match. This match in general is pretty much the WWE version of the ECW Street Fight. And... I liked every bit of it. It was really aggressive for WWE standards from kendo sticks being taken to the back, chair shots, table spots, everything. And even the women got in on it. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of BFAB, but I like Scarlett. She's a pretty decent character. But honestly, seeing how they got in it, it did get annoying. But then thinking about it, I'm like, this is a Philly street fight, so I'll let it pass. And seeing both of them go through a table with no problem, hey, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Shows the women are getting aggressive too. But yeah, the right people won here. I'm happy that the Pride actually did win. I'm happy to see that the Street Profits are definitely taking themselves seriously. Bobby Lashley is a good role model on him. Seeing them possibly win championships and being a strong faction across the board is something I'm looking forward to. This match was fun. I enjoyed it. I really did. I'll give it a 4 out of 5. The next match is LA Knight versus AJ Styles. Like I said in my predictions, I really felt like this match should have been blown off either on a SmackDown or Raw. The feud didn't really build up that well. It was just kind of lukewarm. But it's not that this match actually told a story. It didn't tell a story that much. No, I take that back. AJ Styles just bolted straight to the ring going right for LA Knight. So that shows the frustration that AJ Styles has for LA Knight. It told a story in that sense, how much that this was going to blow over and be done. How much AJ Styles hates LA Knight. And it also had a lot of character growth and a huge arc for LA Knight. Shows how far he can go, how aggressive he can get. And how much you need to take him seriously and stop taking him lightly. This match, I'm not going to say was really aggressive, but it showed the emotion between these two men. Like, they hated each other. They wanted to take each other out. And really seeing how aggressive LA Knight was shows how far he can go to get the job done. Even though I wasn't, wasn't really a huge fan of this feud because it felt like it was kind of thrown together at the last minute, this was a really good way to tell that, hey, I hate you, I want you out, I want you done. Let's get this over with. Let's get this finished. And that's kind of what happened. But honestly, y'all, I really wish I was into the feud a lot more. It just wasn't booked that much. So it wasn't an awful match, like no means. And there was a really, really big character arc when it came to um, when it came to LA Knight as a wrestler. So even though the match was okay, it just I just wish the feud was built better. It just wasn't. But overall, the match was pretty decent. I'm giving it a three out of five. Next match is the United States Championship with Logan Paul as a champion versus Kevin Owens and Randy Orton. I honestly still think that LA Knight should have been inserted in here instead of Randy Orton because Randy Orton doesn't need it. 
but there is a lot of bad blood between Logan Paul and Kevin Owens, and it told a lot of uh, told a really big story between those two. But as for Randy, it also told a story with him too, a huge, huge character change for him, or at least a character arc for him. It shows that even though Randy can somewhat be nice, he's still Randy Orton. He's still the Viper. He will still take advantage of any situation he can get to get a championship. And Kevin Owens kind of discovered that when he was in the match. They were cool starting off, but when you get into a title match, he's going to become the, Vi the Viper, and he's going to fight you and backstab you. And that kind of showed a lot in this match. Logan Paul, as much as I can't stand the guy, it sickens me to say how incredibly athletic he is and how he makes everything look easy. Even though I did not want him to win, it makes sense for him to win here. They're still promoting him to be a SummerSlam as a champion because he's going to be in his hometown of Ohio. And I wouldn't be surprised he's going to be facing Miz because that's his hometown as well. So I knew that he was going to win here because of that. Not really so much because of the match in general. What it did... I mean, it was a pretty good match, and I'm not going to lie. Thank you, Randy Orton, for kicking KSI in the gut. I can't stand that guy. I'm glad that you took it down. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Okay, I'm gonna stop. But other than that, this was really fun. This was a really fun match. It definitely told a good story between all three men. And it definitely showed the character change of Randy Orton that a Viper will still bite you. No matter what. Even though you think he's defamed, he's not defamed. He can still bite you. <laughs> but other than that, yeah, this was actually a good match. The right person won, even though I don't like him. It makes sense for him to keep the title going on SummerSlam. So, I will give this match definitely a 3 out of 5. And the final women's match of WrestleMania 40 is the WWE Women's Championship with EO Sky defending her title against Bayley. Y'all, I'm not gonna lie. I was really impressed on how Bailey and EO worked so well in the ring. This was a really good match. The entrance, though, was kind of lackluster for Bailey, but I love the entrance for EO. It looked awesome. It really did. I hope that that's her graphic from now on. I really do. So her graphic was pretty cool. But they really were like toe to toe in the ring. It felt like there was some confliction because, of course, they used to be friends, and EO Sky kind of used that to her advantage. But if you think about it, and this is the one thing that Prince Gmo kind of mentioned in the Club Atlantis book that is EO really the villain? Because if you remember, Bailey was kind of trying to steal the spotlight from her at the beginning, but then that kind of just tapered down and she started taking hits for everybody. But so they kind of screwed each other over. Like it wasn't one that screwed, screwed one over the other. They both tried to screw each other over. As soon as EO won that championship, she had a target on her back. Not just by other women, but by her own friends, including Bailey, who was supposed to be her closest friend. So in a way, B Bailey was kind of eyeing her title from the jump. And then, of course, when she changed her mind and she started taking hits for everybody, including Asuka, Kyrie, even though her and Kyrie has bad blood, and then also she started taking hits for EO, I don't think they bought it. I think they turned on her because they knew eventually she was going to turn on them. So, I mean, if they went in that direction, I would actually be okay with it because that makes more sense than Bailey being betrayed by EO. Technically, they betrayed each other. That was bound to happen once the championship kind of got involved. And it showed in the ring. The frustration between both women, how Bailey was conflicted because she still thought of her as a friend, how EO didn't really trust her. It showed a lot in the ring. They went all out, especially the counters that EO had against Bailey were phenomenal. And it showed how well they knew each other. I love this match. It was a great match, a great women's match to end WrestleMania. I mean, I'm not saying it's the main event, but it was the next to last main event. It was a, it was a sub main event. So the fact that they had the final women's match of WrestleMania, they went all out. I honestly enjoyed it. Bailey just she knew that she needed it. She knew she needed it more than anyone else. Think of it this way. Bailey is the only four horse woman that has not been able to surpass her old gimmick. Everybody else was able to evolve and just grow. She hasn't. She's been stagnant. Remember, she was pretty much ignored throughout 
all of WrestleMania after winning the Royal Rumble, people kind of ignored her. She really needed this. Her last title reign when she was a hugger, people kind of ignored her there. She needed the attention. She needed it more than Io did, at least in my opinion. But this told a really good story in the match. It showed the heart between both women. This was a very good match to send off on for the women's for the women's division in general, um, for um, um, for WrestleMania um, in general. So honestly, y'all, this match was great. I but. I guess to me, I'm, I'm not going to really rate it lower because of the fact that the entrances was kind of like most of the Bailey, but it told a really good story in the ring. I got to give this a four out of five. This match was actually really good, and I really did enjoy myself watching it. I would actually give the women's championship match a five out of five, but I feel like they kind of wanted to lean to Bailey into being a babyface and EO being a villain, even though they screwed each other. Honestly, if they went the route saying that they screwed each other and just made it into just a competition between both women and seeing who's the best, even though it was an acknowledgement that they both tried to screw each other, which I wish that EO did say that. Honestly, I would have given it a five out of five. But the fact that they were leaning so hard in one direction to make one person a babyface and the other person a villain, in my opinion, it kind of took away from it a little bit, but not too much. It still told a great story. So yeah, I'm gonna keep it a four out of five. All right, y'all, we have made it to the main event, the Undisputed Universal Championship with Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns under Bloodline Rules. I'm going to say this because I have a lot to say about this match. To be honest with you, this match acted like Bloodline Rules was never initiated. What I mean is, is that this entire match in general was the outcome of if Cody won and there was no Bloodline Rules at all. Why I say that is because he had 10 minutes of no interference whatsoever. This was a match that was generally one-on-one. -on -one. You had Paul Heyman on the other side of the ring doing nothing to interfere. You had no Sol Sokoa at the time, and he wasn't even there the previous night. You had no Jimmy. You had no Rock. Nobody was there at all. Nobody was there to control the match. This match was a pure one-on-one. -on -one. If this is what they wanted from the beginning, they should have had Cody win that previous night. The outcome would have made more sense. It didn't make any sense for John Cena to come out of nowhere because we didn't see that Cody was even talking to Cena and asking for help. It made no sense for The Undertaker, even though there is some history between The Undertaker and the Samoan Dynasty in a certain extent, but we didn't even see him talk to Cody. So storyline-wise, it made no sense at all for him to even show up to help anyone. It made more sense for Dustin to be there, and Dustin was there. He was in the stands. Why did he show up to help his brother? I don't know. The storyline was a massive, jumbled up heap of mess. They've done everything they could to fix it, and they couldn't fix it. And fans believe they fixed it because their people, the, the Cody Crybabies, got what they asked for. He finished his story. I knew he was going to finish his story anyway because of the massive amount of promotion they had around him. They were going to get their money back. I knew that they were going to have him. And am I mad about that? No, I just didn't think that Cody needed to be there. I thought it should be Sammy. That's just me. But as for the bloodline rules, it was useless. It was pointless. It had no foundation. It had no structure. It had nothing. It just sounded like a good word to throw out there. If there were bloodline rules, this is how I would do it. I would have The Rock to be the special guest re referee. I would have Solo Sokoa to be the special guest enforcer. Of course, you would have Paul Heyman, the wise man, to be a special guest announcer taking the place of Samantha Irvin. And I would also have Jimmy on the bell. Every Bloodline member at every important corner of that match to affect the outcome. Because if Jimmy was on the bell, he could end that match lickety quick. <laughs> I know it's lickety split. By the or, really, really quick, he can end that match just by ringing. Then you have the final boss that all he can do is do a fast count on Roman and Roman retains. Then you have Sol Sokoa. Every single time that Cody Rhodes goes outside the ring, he gets knocked out. The bloodline will be in more control of that match 
and it would be a bigger obstacle for Cody to face. It would make more sense at that time if he did talk to people to help him, including Seth Rollins, which I do mention the fact that there was a good story that was told here, and I'll get into that in a minute. The fact that we know that Seth Rollins had his back, that's cool. We expect him to come out. The same thing with Jimmy. But if he talked to Cena and Taker and even Stone Cold to come and help him, it would make more sense for them to be out there because he had no way of winning. It was a 5% chance, maybe less than that for him to win. It would make sense for people to come out and help him if it was structured like that. And also, if he did win the previous night and he's supposed to have a fair square match, but somehow out of desperation, the tribal chief decides to have his people come out and try to interfere to prevent him from winning. And then The Rock, at that time, would have looked at the ref saying, if you count this match out and if you end this match, I will fire you. It makes sense for him to use that power there. It would have made more sense, at least to me. But this match was a mess. Storyline-wise, it was a massive mess. Did it tell a story in the ring? Yeah, because like I mentioned before, even though I don't like Cody, Cody is a good storyteller in the ring. He puts his heart and soul into it. I will not deny that. And it did tell a good story in the ring. Should he have been on hoisted on shoulders of everybody as a conquering hero for conquering Thanos? No, it was a bit overkill. It made no sense. Then you had Triple H come out later, shake his hand, hug him, and I guess all fences are mended, <laughs> which is weird because it was Cody that pretty much shot the first shot. It was just weird. But other than that, y'all, this match in general, as well as the fact that Cody and Roman did the best they could on their own for the first 10 minutes, the in-ring match, uh, the in-ring work in itself was pretty good. I'm not going to deny that, but the storytelling was just fudged up all over the place. People are giving this a 5 out of 5. I'm giving it a 3. And I'm not doing it to hate on anybody. Y'all heard my explanation. The storyline was a hot mess. None of it made any sense. The bloodline rules stipulation was stupid and it was pointless with no structure at all. But the in-ring work, the storytelling, you know, the storytelling was not there. The in-ring work was there. So I'm giving it a three. Instead of rating the entire pay-per-view overall, I decided just to rate both of the nights separately. So I'm going to start with night one. Night one definitely gets a three out of five for me. Besides the IC championship match and the world women's uh, and the world women's championship match or the women's world heavyweight championship match whatever it is <laughs> besides those two matches most of the matches in my humble opinion should have been on the raw smackdown it didn't really make any sense to have the six women tag match there because there really wasn't much going on between them and damage control especially with um bianca and i think bianca came in for the save there wasn't really a lot of feud or any issues between them this was just a way for them to showcase jade and the over promotion of jade it really was no reason for this match to happen on there. And especially the Rey Mysterio match with um, Rey Mysterio and um, Andrade versus Santos Escobar and um, Dominic Mysterio. That match, in my humble opinion, should have just been on a Raw or SmackDown. But it was nice to see Lane Johnson and Jason Kelsey there just to represent the Philadelphia Eagles, even though Jason Kelsey retired not that long ago. It was nice for them to actually pay respects to Philadelphia and their team since um, they were in their stadium, so I thought that was pretty nice. But it was a kind of lackluster night. Um, it could have been a lot of improvement there. The main event was way too long. Good Lord, 45 minutes of nothing is way too long. It took a long time for anybody to do anything. It was a drag. And the Bloodline Rules stipulation was just something to look forward to that night. But honestly, that was a very lackluster night one. For night two, I am giving it a four out of five. I know a lot of people are having higher ratings than that. A five out of five saying this was the best WrestleMania ever, saying it was the best main event ever. I have to beg to differ. Now, I'm not really going on all the other matches because the one difference between night two and night one is that for every match that I saw, and I can probably say including the main event, every match has substance, they had character changes, they had heart, they had emotion, they had a reason to be there. WrestleMania should be the ultimate showdown for blood feuds and for championships. 
This is where things end and things should begin. This is what night two was, a new beginning. Yeah, we had someone retain their title. One person retained a title on both nights. You had Rhea Ripley ret retain on night one and you had Logan Paul retain on night two, but there was changes throughout. It showed in every single match. It showed the desperation of how much they wanted the championship. It showed how strong the story was in each one. That is what made night two different from night one. The only reason why I'm giving it a four is because of the main event. The main event's outcome made no sense. It made no sense for Cody to have a one-on-one -on -one when he did not win it. Where was the bloodline? The bloodline should have been in control of the match. It should have been more adversity, more challenges going towards Cody because of the bloodline rules. That is what it was built up to be, but it never happened that way. It was way too easy for him. Yeah, you had people that came out towards the end, but it made no sense because that should have been the outcome of the previous night. If he won and he had one-on-one, -on -one, again, it would have made sense out of desperation for the boss, the final boss, as well as for the tribal chief to have everybody come out to mess things up. But it just didn't make any sense story-wise. The story was just off. But Cody's storyline was always off. It never made any sense. They tried to skirt you in a different direction but it just didn't work. But as for the heart in the ring, as much as I don't like Cody Rhodes, I will give credit where credit is due. He knows how to tell a good story. He knows how to tell a good story in the ring. He knows how to put heart in it. And I'm gonna give, and for somebody that don't like him, I will give him credit for that. I will give him credit that he loves his business. He brought back my favorite title, but the storyline was a mess. And it just seemed like it was just geared for him to have an easy win. And that's what bothers me because this story in itself was built up so high, so hard, so strong to where that Cody had to face so much adversity to even get to that point. But it's just, it didn't end very well, at least not to me. It's not so much the fact that Cody won, it was how it was done. That's my biggest issue. That's why it's getting a four. What are your thoughts about WrestleMania XL? What are your ratings for it? What did you think about the pay-per-view as a whole? Let me know in the comment section below. If you guys like what I do and you like what I say, by all means, subscribe. Like this video and share it with your friends. I will talk to you guys later. Peace out.